an 82-year-old man initially presented to his cardiologist back in 2016 with a 5.8 centimeter infrarenal aortic aneurysm. The patient had a sharp angulated neck uh, proximally, as can be seen in this CT scan. He also had bilateral internal iliac artery aneurysms. On the right, his aneurysm measured approximately 3.4 centimeters, and on the left, it measured uh, about 2.5 centimeters. The decision was made by his cardiologist to proceed with endovascular aortic aneurysm repair. And that same year, he was taken to the cath lab and underwent EVAR using two 32 millimeter overlapping endurant uh, tube stent grafts. The patient was then followed postoperatively with a CTA several months after the procedure. And this CTA demonstrated a large endoleak in the infrarenal AAA sac, likely a type 3 endoleak from poor apposition of the endurant stent grafts and possibly also a type 2 endoleak. There was also some progression of the right internal iliac artery aneurysm, now measuring approximately 3.6 centimeters. Several months after the CT scan, he was again taken to the cath lab and at the time underwent another endograft placement. This time, a 34 millimeter valiant stent was placed between the two endurant stents to attempt to seal the endoleak. This procedure was again unsuccessful and resulted in persistent endoleak, and he was sent to an outside hospital to a vascular surgeon who attempted treatment of the endoleak with a proximal extension cuff as well as a palma stent to attempt to seal the type 3 endoleak. At this outside hospital, the vascular surgeon also performed a trans lumbar embolization and deployed uh, coils within the aneurysm sac. The patient returned to his cardiologist in 2019 with another CT scan. Uh, this time, because of the extensive amount of coils in the aneurysm sac, uh, evaluation for any endoleak was very limited, but uh, the right internal iliac artery aneurysm had progressed significantly and was now measuring 5 centimeters. The patient was now also found to have an iatrogenic left femoral pseudoaneurysm measuring approximately 4 centimeters. The decision was made for no further interventions for these findings at that time. The patient now presents to our emergency department in 2020 with complaints of severe back pain and left side abdominal pain. His aortic aneurysm in his abdomen can be easily palpated and he is tender to palpation over his aneurysm. A CTA of the abdomen and pelvis is now obtained which shows that his aneurysm sac has enlarged from previously a year prior and there is now fluid surrounding the aneurysm sac as can be seen here. The aneurysm has grown from 5.8 centimeters in 2016 prior to his EVAR to now 7.8 centimeters. His right internal iliac artery aneurysm has also grown and is now 5.8 centimeters in diameter. The left femoral pseudoaneurysm has also enlarged over this period and now measures 4.2 centimeters in diameter. These findings of an acute episode of abdominal and back pain, tenderness to palpation over his aneurysm, as well as the CT findings of stranding and fluid around this uh, enlarging AAA are concerning for possible impending rupture. Therefore, a decision is made to proceed to the OR for open repair of his AAA, as well as repair of his internal iliac artery aneurysm and repair of the left femoral pseudoaneurysm. Under general anesthesia, a midline laparotomy incision is created and dissection is carried down past the subcutaneous tissue down to the fascia. The fascia is incised and the peritoneal cavity is entered. A Belford retractor is placed and the transverse colon is retracted superiorly and the small bowel is retracted to the patient's right. The IMV is encountered during a dissection which is ligated between silk ties and divided. 
we incise the posterior parietal peritoneum to enter the retroperitoneal cavity and expose the proximal aorta and aneurysm sac. We obtain proximal circumferential control of the aortic neck uh, just below the renal arteries. We then turn our attention to distal control at the level of the right iliac artery. The small bowel and cecum are retracted superiorly and dissection is carried out in the right retroperitoneum to expose the right external iliac artery. Control of the right external iliac artery is obtained circumferentially with the umbilical tape here. A closer look in this area reveals the large right to internal iliac artery aneurysm and you can see that the ureter is, is plastered to this aneurysm. We carefully dis dissect the right ureter off of the aneurysm and control it with a vessel loop. Further careful dissection is performed to fully free the ureter and protect it. Next we turn our attention to the left side to expose the left uh, external and internal iliac arteries. The sigmoid colon is retracted to the patient's right and superiorly and the white line of tolts of the sigmoid colon is divided to expose the left retroperitoneal space. In this retroperitoneal space, the left external and internal iliac arteries are identified, dissected free, and controlled circumferentially with umbilical tape. A tunnel between the left iliac vessels and the aorta is created through the sigmoid mesocolon and secured with umbilical tape. Having proximal and distal control, the patient is fully heparinized and the aorta is clamped proximally and the iliac arteries are clamped distally. The aneurysm sac is opened with bovielectric cautery and the IMA is uh, known to have uh, perfused bleeding so it's ligated with a silk tie. The sac is further opened in a T fashion and uh, as we open the sac, we quickly note the large amount of coils within the aneurysm sac. Uh, these coils are all evacuated so that we can get to the endograft. Uh, our plan with this procedure is to evacuate all the coils, uh, remove um, the endograft uh, distally and uh, transect the endograft proximally and so our uh, aortic uh, bifurcated Dacron graft to this uh, endograft. As shown here, the endograft is removed and is transected with heavy scissors uh, proximally so that we can uh, sew our Dacron graft to this endograft, uh, incorporating, of course, all of the layers of the aorta uh, with our suture line. Most importantly, uh, getting good bites of the adventitia. So here we perform uh, proximal anastomosis with 3 proline suture in a running fashion, end to end. And again, very importantly, taking large bites and ensuring that we get the endograft uh, in our bites as well as all of the layers of the aorta. The proximal anastomosis is uh, finished here and uh, tested. We then turn our attention to the right external iliac artery. So the right external iliac artery is clamped proximally and distally and this artery is transected here and we then uh, tunnel our right limb of the Dacron graft uh, behind or posterior to the right ureter and we perform an end-to-end -end anastomosis between uh, this right limb and the right external iliac artery here with proline suture in a running fashion. Once this anastomosis is completed and hemostasis is ensured, the left limb of the Dacron graft is tunneled through the sigmoid mesocolon uh, to get to the left external and internal iliac arteries. In this case, uh, we want to maintain perfusion to the pelvis, uh, so we elect to sew our left-sided limb directly to the left internal iliac artery in an end-to-end -end fashion. The anastomosis to the internal iliac artery is uh, much harder than the one to the external because the artery is deep in the pelvis. So this anastomosis is done first. 
Once this is complete, we're going to perform a jump graft to the left external iliac artery. So we clamp the left limb of the Dacron graft proximally and distally and uh, perform a graftotomy. Then we bring an 8 millimeter Dacron graft and sew it in an end to side fashion using foroproline suture uh, to the left limb of the Dacron graft. This 8 millimeter Dacron graft is then tunneled again through the sigmoid mesocolon and this is going to go to the left external iliac artery. Uh, so we then perform an anastomosis between this limb and the left external iliac artery in an end-to-end -end fashion. So then now we're perfusing both the left lower extremity and the pelvis on the left side. And now we return to the right side to address the right internal iliac artery aneurysm. We place two stay sutures through the large aneurysm and this will allow us to maintain control uh, when the aneurysm is open. Once the stay sutures are placed, the aneurysm is opened and the large amount of mural thrombus is evacuated from the inside of the aneurysm. Once the aneurysm is open, the common origin of the anterior and posterior divisions of the internal iliac artery is identified and this common origin is uh, oversown with proline suture and this controls all the back bleeding coming back uh, through the aneurysm. At this point, we can now turn our attention uh, to address the left femoral pseudoaneurysm. A longitudinal incision is made over the left growing, uh, right over the, the pseudoaneurysm, and dissection is carried out proximally. We obtain proximal control of the common femoral artery, and we then dissect distally, obtaining control of the SFA and profunda femoris artery. Uh, these are circumferentially controlled with umbilical tape. Now that we have uh, proximal and distal control, the arteries are clamped and the pseudoaneurysm is entered. And as can be seen, this, this is a very chronic appearing pseudoaneurysm uh, with a capsule and uh, a significant amount of uh, mural thrombus uh, within the aneurysm. And uh, you can see the defect there in the common femoral artery, which is uh, repaired with a bovine pericardial patch and uh, that completes our repair of the left common femoral artery. We of course check Doppler tones ensuring that there's uh, good signals distally to our repair. At this point uh, we turn our attention back to the abdomen and uh, after copious irrigation and hemostasis within the abdomen we proceed to perform a omental flap over our graft. Uh, so a tongue of greater omentum is uh, mobilized and divided uh, between silk ties and this tongue uh, has to be long enough uh, that we can then bring it uh, through the transverse mesocolon and bring it over our graft. Uh, the idea is that this tongue will help uh, to uh, provide well uh, vascularized tissue over our graft and help to hopefully prevent any kind of uh, graft to small bowel erosion in the future. We create a defect in the transverse mesocolon and through this defect our tongue of momentum is brought and placed uh, over the retroperitoneum, right over our Dacron graft. The tongue of momentum is then sutured with a few interrupted vicro sutures to the retroperitoneum, and uh, this is just to hold this piece of momentum uh, over our graft and protecting our graft. And once this is complete and secured in place, uh, we can proceed to close the fascia and the skin which is uh, closed with staples. The left groin is irrigated, we obtain hemostasis and the left groin is closed in layers with PDS for the deep layers and monocro for the skin. And uh, this completes our procedure.